Coming up, the divisional round of the playoffs wraps up and we take a look not only at some takeaways from the way teams perform at a high level around the NFL, also at some concerning reports on offensive coordinator Mike Kafka and rookie grades. Did Joe Shane hit the mark in his second year at the helm when it comes to making those draft day selections? We dive in coming up next. Ah, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your hosts over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. He's healthy, he's wealthy, he's wise, and he's also a man that is going over and checking out our first sponsor, Pytential. Why? Because Pytential is a very easy online assessment, essentially a little survey, that allows you to set benchmarks and track your well-being and gives you coaching to improve it. It's also 100% free for individual users and you can check it out at pytential.com, P-I-E-T-E-N-T-I-A-L. And Andy, divisional round football. They call it the best weekend of football in the NFL. Do you concur following what was really a great slate of games? I do, because because it's the, the happy go-between where you have super wild card weekend where it's like some teams are like, we're just happy to be here. And the championship round, which is like, if one of those games is a dud, then all of a sudden you're only really getting one good game of football. This one kind of weeds out the good teams from the bad. You see who emerges. And also you have two games on Saturday and Sunday. To me, it's it's the best weekend of football there can be outside of the Giants when they're good playing football. <laughs> outside of the Giants being involved in any form, sense, or fashion. Uh, did you find, so uh, the, the I, I, wanna, I was going to jump to the Sunday game, but let's do it in order here a little bit. We'll cover our picks on the back end. Andy, eh, I don't know. You could say he got a little bit lucky. Maybe he went with a classic in the Patrick Mahomes pick there. But Houston uh, takes care, gets taken care of by Baltimore. There's two teams on this weekend that I think, you know, you mentioned it weeds out some of the teams that don't deserve to be there. Houston deserved to be there. Tampa Bay deserved to be there. Also, Tampa Bay for different reasons. You didn't feel like they were going to be a team that was going to be advancing, though it was a good game. Houston against Baltimore, that felt like the one where it was like, hey, rookie quarterback, what an exciting story. Also, thank you so much. Your journey has come to an end, right? Like th Those were the vibes going in that held up very much. Yeah, especially for the Houston game. Like I said, some teams are like, we're just happy to be here or they've already like exceeded expectations. So it's like, okay, like if we mess around and win this game, that'd be great. But like, it's not like life, life or death, which is what it felt like for the Buffalo Bills later on. Um, well, you better believe it, man. The one thing I want, so uh, takeaway wise, like I don't want to get too in the weeds on these games. Uh, the Green Bay San Francisco game was obviously phenomenal as well. But the one thing, if I want to tie this and we're going to touch on rookies and grades later on in this episode, watching the Tampa Bay game and uh, seeing Trey Palmer, he's not a rookie, but watching the way he was utilized that's the next evolution for Jalen Hyatt because he's a speedster. He takes the top off, but guess what? They're lining him up in the slot. He's doing his work over the middle. He's running those slant routes and knowing that route tree, expanding that route tree, it's about getting the ball into the hands of your playmaker. And when you think back to the Giants spending a lot of energy saying jet sweeps, end arounds, pitches, things behind the line of scrimmage, this is let's get the ball moving forward and downfield and see how explosive our guys can be with the ball in their hands. I think Wandale Robinson did a good job of this, but like, I think I did a bit of that over the weekend, like looking at certain players, watching guys and going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, do we have a guy like that? And can he get to that level? Or we're missing a guy like that. Something I noticed in the Buffalo game. Yeah. I mean, look at the text. By the way, I noticed it in every game, quarterbacks, <laughs> you know, players on both sides of the football, offensive linemen. There were a lot of things I noticed the Giants could use. Oh, of, of course. But but I think your point of highlighting some of the draft picks that these teams have made, like ob obviously when you have an MVP caliber quarterback like a Lamar Jackson or a Patrick Mahomes or, or even a Josh Allen right now, the way that they're playing, they can cover up a lot of mistakes. But when you have good quarterback play, maybe not the best quarterback play, you really have to hit on these draft picks and look no further than the Houston Texans. They nailed it with CJ Stroud. Will Anderson looks great. Obviously, Tank Dell looked good before he went down with an injury. And then you 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 mentioned the Detroit Lions. Like, they crushed the draft. And their team transformed into a nice story to a contender immediately. Jameer Gibbs, Campbell, Sam Laporta. Like, when you hit on all of these players, 
all of a sudden you go from like, oh, you know, we're, we're just happy to be here into we think we have an opportunity to go far, maybe even make a Super Bowl. That's what you're kind of hoping to see from this, you know, latest draft class of the Giants. You want to see John Michael Schmitz uh, emerge like a Creed Humphrey. You want to see Jalen Hyatt be able to take it to the house like Trey Palmer. You need to see the progression of these players because all these other teams in the playoffs are having that kind of transformation. Oh, of course, man. And even a team like Tampa Bay, right? They end up falling, obviously, to Detroit. But they're a team that, you know, when you take a step back, it was, uh, and I think they had, uh, uh, Todd Bowles said this in one of the interviews in a pre, ahead of the game or after the game saying, well, we were just a high-level competitive. You know, I know, I know we lost Tom Brady, and I know, you know, we're bringing in a different quarterback. We still have a lot of talent on the roster. He's like, I'm still here. So in some regards, it's like, hey, did you think that they were going to make a deep playoff run? Maybe not. But there is also something to be said for track records of teams, especially when they have some veteran talent. I I'll touch back into some players throughout these games as well. But obviously, New York Giants centric. Guess what? They weren't playing uh, on the weekend. It's just a shame, but they weren't there. There was, however, what I feel like is a continuing theme for the offseason, more interesting updates around the coaching staff. Now, originally, Wink Martindale and all that stuff and, and what went on between him and Brian Dable, okay, fine. You fire some of his coordinators. It looks like it is a rift specifically between those two. There's also a mention about, oh, some you know issues on the offensive side of the football, Joe Shane listening in over the course of a handful of games, and whether or not Mike Kafka would even be willing to make a lateral room at this point. Here's the problem that I have is over on Giants Wire, they had an article on this coming from Dan Benton, but essentially heavily references Jordan Renan, who basically says like he's hearing now from multiple one, two, three, four, five, six sources. And it's only getting more as they move further away from the season that Mike Kafka is maybe as frustrated for different reasons as Wink Martindale was. And he's looking for head coaching job, looking for coordinator job, and maybe that he wants to be gone one way or the other. And Jordan Ron's speculation is that he won't be here, that he is going to move on. Hardly contrasted by the exit interviews for the Giants where they go, expect him to be back, and doesn't that have a familiar ring for coaches on this staff? Yeah, you. it feels like the press conference that Joe Shane and Brian Dable had where they said, we expect Wink Martindale to be back. Now, the difference between these two is Wink Martindale is clearly a more established veteran coach sure. who has led defenses in Baltimore and, and New York, a, a little bit larger than life kind of personality, um, very vocal. Whereas Mike Kafka, this is his first offensive coordinator position. He's He's looked at as a promising and rising offensive mind, but like he doesn't have the cachet necessarily that someone like Wink Martindale does. So he's not going to be as outwardly upset or frustrated with, you know, what the head coach is doing or what the GM is saying. So he, sure. it seems like it's kind of under the radar. But for me, I I, I take what Jordan Renan is saying at face value. Ryan Dunleavy, we mentioned it on the last episode. He, he, he kind of inferred the same thing. Like I said what I said, that he may take a lateral move. It sounds like all the guys that follow the team very closely and are tuned in are like, you know, he doesn't want to be here and the Giants are OK with letting him go. Everything else feels like window dressing at this point. And, and so I, I'm not going to be surprised at all if the Giants need three different coordinators going into next season. Yeah, quotes coming out from uh, Renan in regards to Mike Kafka. Mike Kafka, the more I hear, the less likely it is. And I know he's still there now. Even if he doesn't get a head coaching job, I wouldn't be surprised that the Giants let him out and he ends up somewhere else. He's unhappy. Furthering, I had heard this weeks ago, Renan said, at that point, I had heard it from multiple people. At this point, I'm hearing it from five, six, and seven people. I had heard on multiple occasions that Kafka's deal with it was that Brian Dable was super suffocating. He was overly involved in the offense that was uh, possible, in the offense, if that was possible, even though it's his offense. But really, just in a way, undercutting, completely undercutting Kafka, who is the offensive coordinator. So you have those issues that are building in behind this. And again, we can take the big step back and say, hey, if if this ultimately gets to the place where Brian Dable has total autonomy because he needs to be able to have the right coordinators in place, even if it's on the defensive side where they're going to run the show, he needs to have the right guys, even if it's a figurehead like Andy Reid in Kansas City where, hey, I'm the guy really running this show, but you're there to communicate those plays to the quarterback. Okay, fine. But the double down here is, also around the idea of the decision that the Giants made, even on the defensive side of the ball. Because inside of this, Renan also mentioned, 
I still have not found a single person who said a bad thing about Drew Wilkins. And this is in regards to firing coordinators underneath Wink Martindale before ultimately they parted ways. I know a lot of people think that he's the one out there, the Wilkes brothers, spilling all the beans to people. I really don't think that's true. I don't think they talk to anybody. So I just, again, I, I don't, we're going to go into the season with Brian Dable as the head coach. I mean, let's like, let's be clear. And we're going to be optimistic that his system and maybe they take a quarterback, all the players, all that good stuff. But I, I do still think like this is still a building narrative here. And we're going to get into <laughs> to another rumor about a head coach, a former coach, excuse me, that could be get brought back in and reconnected with Dable. I, I'm at least getting low level like Bill Belichick vibes without all of the success cachet behind it. Right. Like there has to be some concern here that we're walking down like a New England Patriots light Ross uh, coaching staff construction, but without uh, okay. we're, it can feel like we're walking down Joe judge again, right? Like it's like that at least has to be on the table. Understanding Brian Dable accomplished far more in his first year. We think, although Joe judge did have a successful record, like there, there's a lot of correlations here. So, so here's, here's the thing. When Brian Dable was, uh, g given the job as the head coach of the New York Giants. It was his first time as a head coach in the NFL. Right. It feels like he was told who his offensive coordinator was going to be and who his defensive coordinator was going to be. 100%. And there was no, you know, if ands or buts about it. Basically, they were like, unless there's like a 100% a philosophical difference or you guys, you know, Got, got in a street fight five years ago. Like you, you basically are going to take Mike Kafka and Wink Martindale and you are going to like it because this is your first time. You need experience on the defensive side of the ball and you can work with Mike Kafka. Mm -hmm. It now feels like after Dayball won coach of the year and all this stuff comes out, like it also feels like Dayball is saying, Hey, listen, if you think I'm the coach of the year and you want me to be here, allow me to have the people underneath me that I actually want. And it, it begs the question of like, Okay, so should they have just done this from the beginning? Like, even though he's right. a first time head coach, don't you just get like, if you're going to hand him the head coaching position, why do you put one arm behind his back and force him into people that either he doesn't have a relationship with or are bigger personalities than what he's accustomed to? So for me, it just feels like maybe that was the misstep to start all of this that led us down this path. Right. It doesn't have to be about Brian Dable per se. It can be about the organizational decision to, to want him to be successful in his first year. And then the second step after that is, well, okay, so he is successful his first year. He has these coaches on his staff. The second year, they're not successful. And it just feels like, oh, well, obviously it's because I didn't, you know, it's not my own staff and I have all these problems with these guys and it should have been everybody else. But it's like, yeah, but a year ago it worked. So why, why, why couldn't you make it work the second year? And why, when it didn't work, did it feel like you went pretty hard the other way, right? Like you went from, hey, it's all working. I'm coach of the year. Things are clicking. Good progress. Year number two, things aren't going quite right. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. You're not doing it right. Like there's an element there that I don't love. And again, let's just assume that this is all part of the process of, of Brian Dable getting to a place where he has control and has maybe more familiar faces on his staff that he likes and is going to want to work with and coordinate with. And it leads to success on the field. Like all that is good. I do at least have this little bit of concern in the back of my mind, and it's spotlighted by something else there, Andy. Old Maddie Patricia. Maddie Patricia, former head coach of the Detroit Lions, thought he was going to be the guy to take him on this big journey. No, it's Dan Campbell. Uh, he went back to New England, bounced around in different roles there. There's now some speculation because Brian Dable and he overlapped on the, some of those Super Bowl winning teams before he went to Alabama that he could get at least get interviewed for the defensive coordinator position or some role, they said. Doesn't have to be D.C., but some role on the staff. Where do you stand on, on, a, on a name like that getting brought back into the fold? Is it, is it okay at the right role because it's just that his name has lost some cachet after having a bad head coaching stint? And then also taking over some defensive play calling and not necessarily having that look so good either at the back end of this past season. Yeah, so on Matt Patricia, I know people are going to gripe because things have not looked good since he left New England. Obviously, Detroit was a little bit of a mess. Um, you know, some some players kind of came out and said that he was not authentic. He wasn't the right person. I think Darius Slay was actually one of them uh, who <laughs> ended up, re you know, coming back to him in Philadelphia and they and they buried the hatchet, so to speak. But things didn't go well for him in Detroit. Obviously, Dan Campbell has turned that around. Things did not go well for him when he took over play calling duties. In, in Philadelphia on the defensive side of the ball. But Adam, 
let's not forget, like the reason why he took over play calling duties is because they were a tire fire on defense already. Right. It's not like he took it over because someone was ill and then all of a sudden like they fell off a cliff in terms of their production. They were a sinking ship and they tried to leverage Matt Patricia's knowledge to be able to try to, you know, right the ship, so to speak. I have no problem with familiarity of really smart people coming in and being part of this. I do not want Matt Patricia as my defensive coordinator, but right. I have no problem if he is some kind of special assistant, if he's uh, assistant coordinator, like if, if he wants in to have him in the pencils, mix because of familiarity, whatever, like, you know. Why, why, why not? Why not have someone, you know, what, what do they say? He's like an astrophysicist or a rocket scientist, whatever, whatever his uh, his intelligence level is. I, I have no qualms with bringing smart people in. I just don't want him calling the shots on the defensive side of the ball. Listen, I write a lot of things down on a piece of paper and stick it on my shirt. Doesn't make it true. You know what I mean? Uh, no, I don't have any problem with it either. It is just interesting, right? Because I always think a little bit of an alarm bell goes off when you start to associate too much with the Bill Belichick coaching tree because it seems to work when Bill Belichick is control is in control and it doesn't seem to work anywhere else, especially when these guys get elevated to higher roles, right? Like you're always like, huh, you're not as good at your job when there isn't the greatest coach in the history of the game kind of looking over your shoulder and checking the math, right? Like well, that's the concern I have. Well, it's it's not only Bill Belichick, but it's also like outside of Tom Brady being in New England, how has anybody been that successful? Look at Josh yeah. McDaniels. Look at Matt Patricia. Look at Bill Belichick without Tom Brady. Like things are, are – it's very, very easy when you have one of the greatest quarterbacks ever, the most accomplished quarterback ever, and the most accomplished head coach ever. They cover up a lot of things. It's tough out there once, once you leave the nest. And, yes, I have concerns. That's why I wouldn't want them at a top position. But bring them into the building. Why not? I have no problems with that. Now, here's the other thing, too. We'll button this up here before we talk a little bit about rookie class. And then also I'll do a victory lap on my amazing success uh, picking games over the course of these first two rounds of the playoffs in our host battle. It's been a thrill for me. But uh, we know that Jeff uh, Jeff Nixon left. He went you know, to Syracuse and uh, Joel Thomas was hired on January 16th to fill that vacancy from the running backs coach strength and conditioning coordinator, Craig Fitzgerald, he resigned and then they went ahead and had Aaron Wellman come in hired on January 16th as well. Special teams coordinator, Thomas McGahee. He was fired on January 8th, offensive line coach, Bobby Johnson out Carmen uh, Brasillo in for the same position outside linebackers, coach Wilkins, and then defensive assistant Wilkins, both fired defensive coordinator, obviously wink Martindale parts ways. Now I highlight this for a simple reason. This happens all the time, but it's worth noting that the Titans had requested to speak to Mike Kafka about their coaching vacancy. Okay, fine. But the Giants requested to speak to uh, Daryl LaFord, offensive coordinator, offensive line coach, excuse me, for Atlanta. That was denied. So there's one request that they didn't get to do before they hire Brasillo. They also requested to uh, speak to Charger special teams coordinator, Ryan uh, Thicken. That request was denied. They requested to speak to Falcons special teams coordinator, denied. Requested Ravens defensive backs coach, Wilson, denied. Uh, reportedly interviewed. Oh, no, sorry. They did get that interview in for him. Yeah. They also brought in Bowen. They also brought in uh, Chris T uh, Tabor. Who knows that that interview was denied. There's so many layers back and forth to this. And the thing that I'm just trying to get to here is when you look through it, it's like the Brasillo hire looks like it's going to be a good one already getting reports that some players in you know for the Raiders didn't love him as a coach classic uh, you know exit exit commentary but I I do just wonder about the patience level at certain positions and then the urgency at others right when you get denied trying to interview other offensive line coaches and you also make the hire within like a 36 hour window it feels like you are pushing a very quick button because you don't want to get left behind in that discussion I, I just this coaching staff is still going to have a lot to take shape here, right? I'm still going to have a ton of questions, and it feels like the Giants are gearing themselves towards, hey, the proof will be in the coaching pudding, not in significant changes to the way this roster looks or the way our offensive line is constructed. Like, we believe it's coaching and technique and building up these players, not necessarily that we had a failing at the GM level in their moves we made in free agency or the draft. Well, it feels like musical chairs, right? You don't want to be the one still standing without the coach 100%. of your choice. So like sometimes, you know, it's 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 all those, you know, age old sayings like a bird in the hand, right? Like if you have Carmen Brasillo who wants to be there and he's regarded as a pretty good coach, right. like 
you didn't know that Atlanta was going to uh, lift their rejections of, of all of their coaching staff once they got wind that Bill Belichick might bring in a whole new staff if he gets hired. Like, right. you can't just sit back and wait and hope that these teams all of a sudden are like, just kidding, you can now interview this guy. Like, you have to make sure you get at least one of the quality guys because Carmen Brasillo, if he was, you know, shopping himself, probably would have another role with a different team right now. And you'd look yes. pretty foolish if you're holding the bag and you don't have anyone to be able to you, replace Thomas with me. You look pretty foolish if you're the Atlanta Falcons and you didn't assume that Brian Bilicek was going to want to bring in his own staff. Like the idea that you were in the market potentially for him to come in and take this job and you're like, you don't want any art guys? You don't want to you don't want to keep kind well, of but, keep but what's staff? what I mean it, it looks like poor form for Atlanta. Like it it it's it's a little thing where the coaches are like wow like they they don't they don't respect us they don't give us the chance to like go do other things. But right. if you're Atlanta, you're like, I'm just going to hold on to these coaches until the new head coach decides what he yeah. wants to do. Like, why would I Why would I do it? Otherwise, it's usually a professional courtesy. Of course, it didn't happen the way that they wanted it in Atlanta. Waiting for the prom queen to walk into the, uh, pr you know, into the prom, into the ballroom. So you can go, oh, no, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I want to dance with you. I want to dance. Oh, baby, here we go. Why don't you go get yourself some punch? It's just rude. It's incredibly rude. Now, that being the case, the other thing that was happening here for me is just thinking about, as there was an article in The Athletic, that talked about the rookie class for the New York football giants. And we've, we've talked about this before. This came from Charlotte Carroll um, earlier this morning about how do we look at this? How do we look at this rookie class this past year? And what does it tell us about this team going forward? So you have Deontay Banks in the first round. Obviously, you're going to get John Michael Schmitz there in the second. We're going to get that Jalen Hyatt pick, who was the third overall by draft buzz rated wide receiver in the, in the entire class. So you hope that that means big things are coming down the pike. Eric Gray, as well as Trey Hawkins, Jordan Riley, uh, Javarius Owens, and then Tommy DeVito. I have a very specific question just about what this team needs to address in this offseason and draft. But how do you feel about this past year for this draft class overall? I mean, Deontay Banks hit Jalen, Jalen Hyatt, a lot of optimism, but didn't get a lot of usage or as much as we would have liked over the course of the season. Where do you stand on that draft class coming out of this first year? It feels like a pretty mixed bag. And, you know, the more we go over it, like, obviously we have bias and we, we as fans and people that cover the team want to want to look at all the players and think like the best version of them is, is exciting for us. Right. But I would say that it's a little bit underwhelming when you look at the entire draft class as a whole, Adam, because, you know, and, and obviously we have the, we have hindsight to be able to look back and say like, was that a good pick or how did they perform? You don't really have that at draft day, but like make no mistakes. We expected John Michael Smith to be an instant impact at center to yes, be able to yes. right the ship on the offensive line. He, you know, some injuries, some, some poor play. He wasn't, he wasn't as great as we thought he was going to be. Obviously it took a while for Jalen Hyde to get more reps on the field. Eric Gray feels like a big disappointment to me where he, you know, they put him at punt returner and he's fumbling punts. Then he gets hurt. He can't, he can't out snap Matt Breida at some point who we know is a kind of a veteran guy that seemed to not go great. Trey Hawkins had an amazing training camp and then gave up a perfect quarterback or passer rating when 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 quarterbacks were throwing at him like that didn't work out and yes listen he was a sixth round pick for a reason Jordan Riley we heard so many great things about him but then he couldn't get on the field because of the log jam with Leonard Williams and then you know you mentioned Javarius Owens never really uh, you know got a shot then they picked up Tommy DeVito afterwards uh, you know to be able to sign when you look at that draft class it feels relatively uninspired when yeah. we just talked about the Detroit Lions hitting on Jack Campbell, Sam Laporta, Jameer Gibbs, all those players were instant impact players for playoff teams. The Giants were a playoff team a year ago. You would have thought that this class would have been like the next group to help elevate the Giants level of play. Yeah, I tend to agree with you as well. And I have a question specifically about when you think about some of these key players, but uh, as I often like to do, and we're going to do this um, in, in a full scope here. Hey, in the fifth round, do you know who was taken five picks after Eric Gray? It's tech, uh, let's say one, two, three, four. Yeah, five picks later. Fifth round, 177th overall. Puka Nakua. You better believe it, baby. It's that little wide receiver for the L.A. Rams. Now, of course, we all know. He gets drafted to the Giants. He probably looks not even nearly as good or impressive or optimistically as Jalen Hyatt does, right? And yet. 
to your point, fifth round picks, we know these are dart throws. You're just looking for guys that you want to bring into the fold. They're already talking about whether or not the Giants are going to maybe look in the draft or think about a, a player on the free agent market at the running back spot to help fill out that room. That Eric Gray may not be a part of it. They, they got rid of and brought back Corbin, right? They brought in another running back who never saw the field. I can't remember his name at the moment. You know, you brought in all of these bodies. So at that point, I don't care if it's Puka Nakua or if it's going to be Warren uh, you know, McClendon, who went to the L.A. Rams as well, who had, by the way, had three picks at the back end of the fifth round for crying out loud. They also took Davis Allen at the tight end spot. Like, I don't care what the other names could have been or what the results could have been. All we can really look at here is that Eric Gray did not really get a lot of sample size here. 17 carries, it looks like 48 yards, if I'm doing the quick math here correctly. Yes, I did. Like, you know, fine. If he's a non-factor, then that means there could have been another option out there, and that certainly feels a little frustrating. Here's my question for you. I was thinking about, like, one of the biggest successes was Deontay Banks. Now, he ends up getting hurt at the end of the year, but we feel like, hey, we did hit on that. When you look at the defensive side of the ball, and we'll do a full episode on this, but as a tease, where do you think the Giants need to improve themselves the most? In the secondary or in the front seven? Ooh, good question, Adam. I am I am going to say the secondary for me because if you look at Adore Jackson not being here, you look mm -hmm. at the departure of James Bradbury, you look at Julian Love who made the Pro Bowl, you know, for the Seattle Seahawks who who walked out the door. The Giants have lost a lot of talent and they haven't been able to replace it with a guy that even gives you 80% or 90% of what you're looking for. Sure. Now they have this interesting question of, do you want to pay Xavier McKinney $15 million a year, or we continue this trend where it gets thinner and thinner in the secondary. But, you know, if Xavier McKinney walks out the door and Adore Jackson isn't re-signed, look at who's left at the cornerback in the safety position. You're yeah. basically hoping Jason Pinnock, Dane Belton, maybe Nick McLeod's back. You're looking at a guy like Darnay Holmes, who's been underwhelming his whole time, uh, you know, with the, with the Giants. You're looking at Cordell Flott. Is he going to emerge and be a, an every down starter alongside of, of Tay Banks? There are so many question marks in the secondary that it is a huge concern of mine that needs to be addressed, maybe even with multiple picks in the upcoming draft to be able to shore things up. Yeah, it's interesting, right? And I think really why I brought it up is because philosophically, what is the identity of this team going to be? You heard about this um, over the course of the playoffs for the Detroit Lions. It was the year prior, they weren't really good in either phase of defensive football against the pass or the run. And the Austin said, well, what are we going to be? We're going to stop one or the other. And they chose to say, we're going to stop the run and we're going to live with some of those results in the secondary. And I wonder how the Giants identify that because right now, by talent, you say, well, we have Dexter Lawrence, we have Kayvon Thibodeau, we have Aziz Ojolari, we have Bobby Okereke, right? Maybe Jordan Riley, you know, some players mixed in, okay, Robinson, et cetera. We have, there's a lot of names there. So you feel like, well, maybe they should just do a better job. <laughs> you know, if they do a better job in their roles, then we're better on the back end. To your point, the talent void is in the secondary. But as we know, if you don't get the job done up front, then even the best of secondaries get exposed, right? What's going to happen with Xavier McKinney is a big factor too. Are you going to go with Pinnock and you're going to hope that you're going to get a little bit more out of Dane Belton going forward, right? So there's a lot of questions there. But to your point, I think as we start to look ahead to the draft class and we do our reviews of each position and expectations, boy, I can make a very strong case that if you believe coaching is going to solve some of your offensive line concerns, that whether or not we totally agree with it, the Giants are looking at it as we already invested in the, in, the, in certain positions. Those yes. will be coached to success. Where have we not invested in those positions? And that's where I think you start to follow the trail of how they approach free agency and the draft as well. Could not agree more. That's the issue. Joe Shane has tried to address the offensive line. It just hasn't worked out. They spent a first-round pick on Evan Neal. They spent a first-round pick on Andrew Thomas. They spent – a high draft pick on John Michael Schmitz. They went out and with the limited dollars they had signed Mark Lewinsky. Like they've tried, they, they drafted Joshua Zudu, Marcus McKeithen. Like they, they literally have tried to address it and it has not been successful. At some point you have to say like, we want to continue to evaluate these players, but we need someone to get the most out of these players. And I think that's the real hope of Carmen Brasillo coming in is saying like, we can't just continue to throw high draft picks at this problem. If the problem isn't, the, you know, 
the the talent it's getting the most out of the talent that's there well, right yeah it, it, well it's one of two things either we believe the coach wasn't getting enough out of the talent or we screwed up consistently every year for the past couple of seasons right and you don't want that to be the case if you're joe shane before we get out the door here we are going to be doing our positional reviews midweek we're going to have our, our previews obviously of the championship round a lot of fun there and we'll talk more about these games there was some really good stuff that came out of this past weekend but just quickly we also had a little coach battle. Uh, sorry, host battle going on. I keep referring to us as coaches, Andy. Maybe it's just something in our future. I don't I'll know for sure. It. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I'll take it. I went with the Ravens minus nine and a half. Never in doubt. Two point play. Lock it up. I also took Detroit minus six and a half. A little bit. You know, got a little tighter there, but got that for my three point play. You turned in the card with the 49ers minus nine and a half. You foolish, foolish man. You did not catch that one, but you did get the Chiefs. You did trust and put your faith in Patrick Mahomes plus two and a half. You got the three-point play there. So by the skin of your teeth, you are now turning in a 6.2 round performance so far. While yours truly, I have hit on four out of five of my selections and sit with a seismic 10-point performance. You were you were so brave taking two home favorites in the, in the divisional round. Like who, who would have thought? Thank you. At least I went out on a limb and took the Chiefs on the road as an underdog to even outright win the game. So, you know, I'll give myself a little pat on the back. I, I have a question for you though, Adam. Yeah. So, you know, maybe maybe this is one of our, our finishing questions. We know that the Giants need to address the wide receiver position at some point, whether oh, yeah. it's through the draft or free agency. There are two players that just finished up their season in Stefan Diggs and Mike Evans, who are both around the same age. Mm -hmm. I, I would be, sh I'll, I'll say this Mike Evans is a free agent. Stefan Diggs, I will be shocked. If he is wearing a Buffalo Bills uniform come week one of next year, if you had your choice, would you want either of them on the Giants knowing that Mike Evans' projected contract is going to be about $24 million a year? Stefan Diggs is making $26, $27 million. They're both about 30 years old. Would you sign up to be able to take the, one of those on knowing the Giants do need to address the position? I wouldn't. I wouldn't take either one of them. Personally, uh, for different reasons, I, I just think that uh, again, like D Diggs, I think from a personality standpoint, just has a little bit of a vibe, a little bit of a wide receiver energy to him that I think would be hard, especially if you think that Daniel Jones is going to come back and play this year. I don't think he's going to transition well from Josh Allen to Daniel Jones necessarily. Mike Evans, for different reasons, I just, I, 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 I he's played at a very high level for a very long time, and I feel like the next team that gets him you get to see him go off the cliff, right? Like, I just feel like you're you're buying something at exactly the wrong time. If I had to invest in the position, right? Big dollars. I said this in the offseason previously. I would just go, if I had to spend 20 million on a wide receiver right now, right? You have to make your choice. One, two, or option three is T Higgins. I would go with T Higgins. He's a little bit younger. He showed upside even without Jamar Chase out there. Like, if I had to, but we'll have a different discussion coming down the road here when it comes to that position and how the Giants should improve it. I mean, at the end of the day, Adam, yeah, 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 the yeah, Giants, yeah. the Giants have to address the position. These are the questions that Joe Shane is going to have to answer. Wouldn't it be nice to have a six-five wide athletic wide receiver like Mike Evans to help along either Daniel Jones or the quarterback to to that that has not been named yet? I mean, you know, he it's not like he's a six, you know, a four-three burner type of guy. Mm -hmm. He's a taller possession type of wide receiver that the Giants really could use right now. But to your point, he'll be he'll be almost 31 years old when next season starts. Do you want to be paying uh, a wide receiver $25 million into his mid-30s? Buddy, these are the questions that we need answers to, and it's going to extend well into this offseason. And if you are the New York football Giants and you've been talking about how, well, hits or misses, did you do it all perfectly correct? Remember, Go see our friends over at Personum because they are an AI-driven cyber threat detection engine. So no excuses, guys. Nobody stole your draft cards. Nobody shuffled up your scouting profiles here. Personum improves your vision into your network security environment and allows you to see cyber threats that other detection tools and platforms just can't. Go to Personum because it's always vigilant, always learning. And what we're always doing is learning about where we think the Giants are going to go over on YouTube at One Giant Podcast, on Twitter at One Giant Podcast, at AndyMac214, at Adam Armbrecht. We said we have positional reviews coming up. We're going to start to discuss free agency. There is a target that played in that game for the Bills that is a free agent that has New York football giant written all over them. But we'll get into that 
as we continue our offseason surge here. And also, big news coming. In the next couple of weeks, we have a whole new thing, a whole new platform, where we're going to expand the content that we bring to you all offseason long. So stay tuned for that. But until then, until the next time, until the people's champion rides again, as Andrew Makowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.